Okay, well, thank you, and uh, it's uh, great to uh, be here to talk to you today about phlebology, not phlebotomy, but phlebology. And uh, that uh, is, has to do with venous disease. And uh, so we're going to talk today uh, about venous disease in its various forms. Uh, the title of this lecture used to be Spectrum of Venous Disease, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about some deep system disease, superficial system disease, and since uh, there's a lot of house staff and attending here from different disciplines, you know, some are on surgery, medicine, uh, emergency room, yeah, ER, um, interventional radiology, I'm sure pediatrics. Um, so hopefully I'll try to incorporate something, a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, you know, when I was a house staff and uh, even in attending, I always uh, felt that uh, you know if you could learn one thing. Uh, from a lecture, um, it was worth it, especially if it impacted the patient's uh, patient's life. So let's uh, let's begin today. Kind of go back to a little bit of anatomy. And um, anybody recognize this area here? Uh, that is the saphenal femoral junction. And uh, it used to be that uh, when treating venous disease when people had uh, flesh ligation and stripping, uh, which is not done as very much anymore. It is in some circumstances. Uh, but uh, when you did flesh ligation uh, for varicose veins, uh, you would come up to the uh, saphenal femoral junction, which is an optimal vein, great fatness vein. And then, uh, you know, for surgery, you know, they might kind of tempt you on a little bit of the different uh, uh, branches and so forth of the saphenal femoral junction. One of the successes of doing a flush ligation is making sure you get flush ligation right here. You can see that you have a pelvic source of reflux, and that's a key um, term that we're going to be using for venous disease is reflux. Uh, when you have pelvic source of reflux, uh, uh, which uh, definitely can happen, you know, you remember you have a deep external pudendal vein, superficial external pudendal vein, and if you didn't ligate all of these and you had a reflux, you could have variation in anatomy, uh, or this would go into great fatness and you would have a failed uh, flush ligation and a recurrence of venous disease. So um, um, today we do endothermal ablation, uh, where we actually put a catheter in up to the saphenal thermal junction and heat ablate that. You did have recurrences, and it turns out descending is not the only way to have recurrence of venous disease. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, at Mayfest, which is here at Tulsa, uh, I just kind of had to get a picture of this. And it's kind of a root system uh, there. And it kind of looks like the, you know, that with the wrong junction. So I thought it was kind of cool uh, to get that picture there. So we're going to begin with a little bit of a case. Uh, it's a little wordy. I'll just read it to you. Uh, and uh, this is a, a young lady that presented to the office, 26-year-old female, hip, history of port wine stain to the left leg from birth. Infant had a varicose vein from the knee down and had it checked out when she was an infant. Doesn't remember who. Started having bulging, noticeable veins in the thigh when in college. Not really tender, but the past two years had been enlarging. Just went on a trip flying to California. While there, noted that both legs and ankles were swollen and subsided more bulging to the left lane, and then approximately three weeks ago, she's kind of in foot pain uh, and got an injection uh, to the heel for plantar fasciitis. Um, but she'd had some local phlebitis around the knee, tender along the left knee. She's a runner with restless legs and now has edema at the end of the day, elevation helps and so forth. Um, don't know if this really kind of shows up. She could maybe see this kind of uh, hypo and hyperpigmented area all along here and all along the side. And you can kind of notice she has kind of these varicosities down only on one leg. Uh, a little bit uh, asymmetric, maybe a little bit more enlarged here on the calf. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, our ultrasound in the office and uh, I do my own ultrasounds, uh, certified in uh, venous uh, uh, sonography. 
And uh, no DBT, mild deep reflux on the left. We'll talk about reflux again. There's that word. Severe staphylofemoral junction and GSV reflux. So we kind of looked at the anatomy. Isolated four centimeter non-compressibility and superficial phlebitis. So she had uh, thrombophlebitis of the great saphenous vein and severe reflux and varicosities, upper thigh and calf, the port line. And so when you think of uh, um, port line stain, varicose veins, there are actually some congenital conditions you should uh, be thinking of. Uh, that's just a wordy thing on the deep system there. So it's a, this is sort of a long convoluted case, but I'll try to summarize it. Uh, she's doing fine. Um, because of congenital abnormalities, um, you can have other ABMs or you can have deep system abnormalities. And it turns out they sent her for an interventional radiology evaluation for like a venogram and uh, <clears throat> we thought she might have some proximal obstruction. Her hemoglobin was 5.8, so they really couldn't do anything at that time. For her phlebitis, uh, you know, with her compression, uh, non-steroidals, um, saw her back the next week, uh, but did not really know about this uh, hemoglobin. The next visit, she had an extension. So again, you know, this can kind of uh, cross many boundaries uh, from office-based medicine to emergency medicine. And what do you do with a uh, superficial thrombophlebitis that uh, starts to uh, 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 fail compression and so forth um, with an anemia on top of it. So you got to think about an anticoagulant this patient or how do you, how do you work with that. Uh, because of that clot extension, um, and it was getting up into that saphenoid junction near the deep system, uh, went ahead and ablated uh, proximal to that to kind of help protect her. Um, and then uh, second opinion that we sent her to, actually she had a popliteal clot. So here you've got somebody that sort of uh, has a clot, probably bias, uh, failing that, and then with an anemia. Um, and so what do you do? So you didn't really want to fully anticoagulate it until we kind of figured out what the uh, anemia was from. Most commonly mineralogia, but you couldn't exclude the GI source. So she did have a removable IBC filter placed, and the key is it's removable. You know, put those things in, you got to have a reason, and then you try to get those things out uh, once uh, they're not needed. We did put her on Lovenox, um, and uh, there were some abnormal iliac anatomy suggested uh, with her filter placement. She did have a GI procedure and evaluation, uh, no uh, big gastric or, or a colonoscopy, all that stuff was okay, and her hemoglobin was improving on iron. She eventually had an IVUS, an intravascular ultrasound. Is anybody familiar with those? Might be from coronary, um, but you can actually put a uh, ultrasound up the iliac vein and look for compression syndromes. Anybody ever heard of Mayturner, Mayturner's syndrome? Yes, uh, some people were shaking their heads, yes. Um, she had the eventual IVUS with May Turner, and the stent was deployed, and the, uh, 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 once her hemolyl was improving, we could anticoagulate her and so forth, and uh, took the, uh, uh, the filter out. So the prescription at that time was three months of Geralto, lifelong aspirin since she had a stent. She saw her GYN her in between all this. She did have a hypercoagulable panel that people are thinking about, you know, factor five ligand per thrombin G2 and P1A for PC and S deficiency and so forth. Uh, and somebody with, uh, uh, you know, uh, co coagulation problems. And then um, bring her back once she recanulizes and she has already come back, had a, a radio frequency ablation, talk about that uh, soon, and then phlebectomy, uh, those varicosities. Because once you have thrombophlebitis in those veins, that's a nidus for further thrombophlebitis, and so you kind of have to deal with uh, that, and she is very compliant in her compression. So her diagnosis was a sort of like flipotronomy like syndrome. Uh, those patients can have uh, port line stains, uh, var varicose or venous abnormalities, lymphatic abnormalities, uh, arterial abnormalities. Uh, sometimes they have a persistent lateral vein. There's kind of a variation 
Um, and you've seen people with asymmetric uh, hypertrophy bony overgrowth. She did not have all of those elements, so it was kind of a light system. Parks Weber is the above plus AD Gestures. So um, that incorporates a lot um, about venous disease, right? We talked about coagulation, we talked about varicose veins, uh, we talked about capillary malformations, and so forth. So phlebology uh, really incorporates uh, the, whole, the, whole, the whole system, right? So what do you tell your patients about this? Maybe you're in your position, somebody comes in with leg pain, you know, this is what they look like. Maybe you're uh, you know, family practitioner, your patient comes in and states that they have aching in the legs and restless legs. You know, what do you tell your patient that has the leg that looks like this? Maybe they come to the wound center and have an ulceration and they have this. Well, one reason I kind of like this picture is it's the patient standing. Oftentimes in the hospital, when we do histories and physicals and so forth, if you can get the patient to stand, you ought to get the patient to stand. Not only does it from a venous standpoint, you know, because somebody laying flat, they may not have pronounced venous disease, and they come in with leg pain, cramping, AP, and yeah, you know, follow up with primary care or so forth. Uh, but until you actually stand the patient and see uh, their venous disease, um, conversely, you can stand the patient and have severe venous disease and have no varicosities. Um, but uh, you know, you gotta get your patients to stand if able. Not only you know evaluates their balance, right, their neurological status, you know, physical therapy, and so forth. So if you can't stand the patient when they're in the hospital, uh, you should observe them uh, ambulating and walking to look at them. So again, what do you tell your patients about that? How about this? This is one of my patients that uh, um, she probably hasn't worn uh, shorts or got out in public uh, with shorts on in about 20 years. Because she was in the supermarket and somebody said, uh, you know, you know, do those hurt? I think I know somebody that can fix those. And she was so self-conscious about that, um, you know, she yeah, didn't wear shorts. Um, what about that? Okay, that type, that patient right there. What's so striking about that patient? Is that venous disease? Well, uh, we're going to go through a differential of leg swelling here in a little bit, and that's lipoedema. Okay, uh, some people actually starve themselves trying to get rid of that, and that's a typically a hereditary condition called lipoedema. One of the characteristics that you can think about is you see this cutoff sign. That's not from her wearing shoes. That is actually a characteristic where you have large legs, a lot of adipose tissue. And then you have normal feet, and there's a characteristic cutoff sign. So when you see that, that is lipoedema. Can you have lipoedema, venous edema? Can you have lymphedema, which is a little bit different, and lipoedema, all in the same patient? Yes, you go lipolymphedema. Uh, this is characteristic of lipoedema. Uh, these, tip these patients typically have very sensitive skin. And trying to get them a compression is kind of hard. Compression sometimes doesn't help. Uh, it's even more judicious when you use that. How about this? You might see this in the emergency room. You might see this admitted at uh, acute cellulitis. Um, but, uh, and this patient is totally asymptomatic. But what's the redness and the skin changes and so forth? It's kind of a venous eczema. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. A little bit about anatomy in the venous disease. Remember, arteries go down, veins go up, and water inside veins. Check valves. Right? You know, they have valves in veins. Otherwise, uh, the uh, pressure to the ankle, if you think about just centimeters of water or millimeters for every hour you want to measure it, you know, it's centimeters of water. From your heart to your ankle, without valves, the highest point of pressure is at the ankle. And where do we get most venous ulcers? Around the ankle. Right? So um, you have ambulatory venous hypertension, and uh, we'll talk about that coming up. So we'll kind of build on this. 
this is a patient. Uh, you know, that might be. That is, yeah. Uh, a lady that had a venous ulcer lost in any kind of heart deal. Uh, she had a bare cough fever and went right through this. She had an ablation uh, and she did fine. How about this? You might see this in the emergency room. You might see this on vascular surgery. You might see this on interventional cardiology, uh, interventional radiology. Uh, this patient has Lemnasia cerulodolans. Uh, and anybody familiar with Lemnasia cerulodolans? And that's a venous clot or DVT so severe that the arterial inflow is compromised because the venous outflow is severely obstructed. This might be somebody that needs a mechanical bronchial mechanical thrombo, uh, lysis um, of their DVT. Or let's talk uh, about this lady here, uh, which is actually a healing venous ulcer that had been there for over 10 years. And is there an age limit which you can intervene with phlebology? Well, she's 91. <coughs> and she is very happy. Uh, to uh, uh, have this uh, ulcer not bothering her in severe pain. Uh, uh, for some time. So again, phlebology incorporates a lot of different things. So here's this thing I just thought I'd put in here, dogma. All right. Uh, or do, you do you know what is only right in your uh, attending eyes? Or may you never pass with your assets intact, you know, dogma. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that we learn at the school uh, and so forth, and they change, right? Beta blockers for acute MI, right? It used to be kind of heresy. Now that's kind of uh, the main thing, right? Uh, permissive hypercapnia. You know, there's uh, a lot of different things that we learn in medicine uh, that at one time had to do it this way. But I would suggest to you that uh, you know learn your basics uh, and keep an open mind for improvement and change uh, for your patients. Uh, to learn, you must realize that you do not know. That's something that I've always kind of uh, learned. Is uh, you know you've got to make sure that you're ready, willing, and able to always learn. Patient with a venous uh, chronic lung thing, venous ulcer after inhalation, you'll notice that. Uh, uh, edema is much resolved. And he's doing fine. That little lady that uh, had uh, varicosities on the back of her legs and her thighs, you know, with some sclerotherapy, uh, has done well. Uh, you know, still a little bit of stain, but that'll usually go away. Um, and she feels much better about herself. Lady with a large varicosity and great sadness. Here, it's a week after colectomy and uh, that, and then three months. Um, and her restless legs uh, are gone. So, I'm going to jump around a little bit just to kind of keep it interesting. Uh, here's a super inguinal venous anatomy, uh, interventional radiology, Dr. Cook, uh, interventional cardiology, uh, very familiar with this. And we brought up that thing called May Turners, right? And um, that's actually a specific source of iliac compression syndrome. Uh, so how many people in here have seen a DVT? I'm sure everybody's probably seen a DVT. How about a young female, classic, uh, with a left-sided acute DVT that involves the deep system? And, uh, and uh, our proximal system, and by that mean I mean the common femoral uh, um, and this is kind of a little bit of anatomy. You know, it's the aorta. And when the aorta bifurcates, the right iliac crosses the left, the right iliac artery crosses the left iliac vein right here between the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae. Over time, that anatomical abnormality uh, forms spurring, webbing in that area and can predispose somebody to, um, you know, they have Birch House triad, right? Stasis, hyperflagical state, endothelial damage, right? 
So if they have found a hypercoagulable state, have an endothelial damage of some sort, that's two out of three, right? And they have a predisposing factor, they can have an acute DVT in the left leg. And that's the classic maze herders. So um, that actually, uh, you know, once they can have either pharmacomechanical or pharmacomechanical they put an intravascular ultrasound catheter, they'll be able to see this compression syndrome, and that's typically where they'll put a stent in uh, for venous outflow. Dr. Foote just uh, had a patient time last Friday uh, that was having uh, normal ABIs, edema, not so bad venous uh, disease, and uh, kind of heaviness in her legs, and uh, her ab abnormality on her uh, waveform on her uh, ultrasound. Uh, this was her presentation. That's not her on the screen, but demonstrates uh, some anatomy and uh, so forth. A lot of these things are board questions. I'm kind of a board question type of guy, so hopefully you might see some of this uh, later on. This is just uh, how we want to go over embryology. You know, I kind of have to know this all the time to figure out where the uh, inferior vein edema is advocates and where this is the anterior posterior carpal veins. You know, maybe pediatrics for uh, um, different congenital anomalies, but those, you know, kind of tells you where you have crossovers uh, in your uh, vascular system and where things kind of come from. So if you see weird anatomy like duplicated vena cavas and so forth, you kind of know where they came from and that. So, again, uh, you know, you've got to know your anatomy, and these are the deep veins of the lower extremity. And again, is the uh, posterior tubule vein, is that a deep vein? Yes. So if you have a DVT in the posterior tubule vein, that is a deep vein, and it can propagate to the popliteal vein and on up into the femoral vein. We drop the name superficial because when people got uh, ultrasound reports and they had a clot in their superficial femoral vein, uh, people thought it was a superficial vein, and they did not treat it. So that is no longer the proper term, superficial, it's just femoral vein and deep uh, femoral vein. But uh, some places that you might practice, if you get an ultrasound report that your patient has a uh, clot in the superficial femoral vein, that is a DVT. Okay. Um, so, Gastric venous veins, all of those, uh, in the, the popliteal vein, which then goes to the femoral vein, common femoral, iliac, and IVC. Um, <clears throat> now we'll talk about the great saphenal stain. Back to that first slide. Uh, and the saphenal femoral junction with its uh, tributary sphere. There are things <coughs> called perforator veins. And perforator veins connect the superficial veins the deep veins. And look at all these valves. Okay. You have uh, valves in the deep veins, in the femoral vein, popliteal vein, and so forth, but they are much less so than valves in the superficial veins, like the great saphenous, small saphenous, and tributaries. Why? Because you have muscles in the deep veins, right? And that's the calf muscle pump mechanism. When you're ambulating, those muscles squeeze those deep veins, ratchets them up. That's why 90% of your blood flow return from your VIA system is through the deep system. Only about 10% goes through the great saphenous system. So which, which system is connected to your skin? The great saphenous system, small saphenous system. So conversely, ulcerations typically involve the superficial VIA system. But you can have combinations. And when you have combinations of deep and superficial reflux, it's worse than either one alone. So again, perforators also have valves. So when the muscle squeezes, that valve should close right here, right? You should check it. And on relaxation of the muscle, the superficial system enters. Okay? Now you can start thinking about runners or cyclers or um, people that have high impact, weightlifters, so forth. If they have perforator incompetence, they'll actually kind of have, uh, you know, when they're contracting, that force will go both ways, right? Okay. 
and that's fine, but if they have perforator incontinence, there's a lot of high pressure being added to the superficial system, causing problems. So when we talk about venous ulcers, and remember, venous ulcers are kind of down near the ankle, and then we have over 60 perforators you know, from the knee down, about 150 per, 120 perforators from the leg, typically, but there are a lot of perforators um, kind of in the lower extremity knees or some of the Kind of the old named ones, you know, you don't really go by names much anymore, but sometimes they may show up or if you're at the bedside or, you know, on surgery and they start talking about pocket perforators, you'll kind of know that they come off the posterior arch uh, uh, GSD and cap. And another name is Leonardo's name, just let me bring that up. Okay, so a little bit. More, a little uh, in depth. Um, you know, you have thousands of veins in the lower extremity. Now you get a little more detail here. Deep veins, here's your great saphenous vein, here's the anterior great saphenous vein, and so forth. And you see there's a lot of connections. Okay. There's a lot of connections between the great saphenous vein and the posterior great saphenous vein, and it tells the posterior medial people. Name of the vein of Giacomini that kind of comes down here. Um, the great saphenous vein may connect to your small saphenous vein. That'll be important because when we talk about venous ulcers, there's no uh, issues there. So hopefully, I think uh, frequently asked questions. You know, uh, when you have like a vein practice, one of the things are is, is uh, people come in and say, you know, aren't vein practice just cosmetic or is fossil? No, and I hope hopefully you kind of get a little bit of semblance of that. Um, phlebology practice encompasses a wide range of services depending on your background uh, and uh, what you deal with. Um, some uh, vein practices may deal with the deep system, uh, such as vein turners, thrombolytic therapy, venting, stenting, coiling, so forth. Some people may more, and you know, I don't do deep system. You know, that's not in my purview, so I do more superficial system. Great sap and small sap is perforator tributary disease. So sometimes certainly patients uh, may go to the main practice with an intent of a cosmetic outcome, and certainly they may be very symptomatic, and we're going to talk a little bit about more of the superficial stuff uh, uh, coming up here. Um, but the evaluation always begins with a history and physical, just like anything else, and a duplex ultrasound specifically for reflux. Now we're going to get into that. Uh, surprising number of patients when carefully questioned about their leg discomfort, their symptoms can be attributed to venous disease. How many have written prescriptions for restless legs? You know what causes restless legs? You know, everyone kind of knows, but venous disease can certainly cause restless legs. It's not the only cause of restless legs. Uh, but one of the things that they do have, venous reflux is very satisfying when people actually, you know, the restless legs much improved or gone. So let's talk about some uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, patients with typical symptoms of venous insufficiency, they may have a constellation. They may come in with big varicosities like we saw in the very first uh, slide there uh, that are symptomatic. They may have a history of venous ulcers. They may come into the hospital with recurrent cellulitis uh, and ulcerations. Uh, you definitely want to get ankle brachial index, right? You're getting right from the floor. Lower extremity uh, wound, right? Because you must exclude arterial. You know, that rule of the artery is supreme, right? Okay? So you got to make sure you have good arterial flow uh, because a lot of these people are going to use compression on. So you must, uh, you know, exclude arterial disease. Um, they may have no skin changes and have symptoms of aching fatigue or kind of heaviness, kind of they'll say, kind of, you know, I don't know, they just kind of bother me. Well, are they kind of like heavy? Yeah, you know, are they achy? Oh, yeah, they ache. Um, do you have cramping? Oh, yeah, I've got cramps at night. Yeah, I mean, um, do they have edema? We're going to go through kind of an evaluation of edema real quick here, too. Uh, do they have itching? Um, restless legs? And I kind of want you to think about why they might have itching. Um, numbness? Why would they have numbness? Uh, or leg ulcers. You know, it's usually on the medial, but they can have lateral ulcerations, as we will uh, uh, see. Okay, this is something that if you're familiar with treating venous ulcers, 
is that you know I've done wound care for over 20 years and um, uh, treated a lot of venous ulcers, and this gets touted of the SCAR trial for you know surgery versus compression versus plus surgery uh, for treatment of uh, venous ulcers, and the sort of outcome in this was is um, there was no difference in healing the ulcers, but there was a major difference in ulcer recurrence. And in fact, it's recommended if you had uh, an ulceration that you consider for an endovenous uh, or a some type of venous procedure to help prevent recurrence. And that's a class one B recommendation. Um, and uh, there is some stuff that's, uh, uh, you know, methodology flaws, like people it took them seven weeks before they got surgery in the surgery group and so forth. Uh, but if you're familiar with this, um, one of the major outcomes is they have a venous ulcer. Uh, they're likely to recur, especially when they're not compliant with depression. So those patients that have a history of venous ulcers should be considered for some type of endovenous ablation if they're a candidate. So again, just trying to talk compression is the mainstay of treatment with venous ulcers. Um, and we just talked about um, grade 1A ablation uh, of incontinent superficial veins in addition to compression for reduced recurrence of venous ulcers. So, how common is venous disease? Well, 4.5, 12.2 million people in the U.S. Um, over 40% of women in their 50s are suffering with some type of venous disorder. And over 60% of Americans suffer from some type of venous disease. It's much more common to have venous disease than arterial disease. Now, with arterial disease, um, you know, if you have severe critical ischemia, you know, that's, you know, possibly an amputation. And can you have the two combined? Yes. So you kind of have to investigate that. Um, this is just something that I kind of worry here. So if you just take the uh, population of Tulsa County, you know, 600,000, and you go through males and females, the antimension prevalence and so forth, of reflux and symptoms, um, and then you, that was age 35 to 65, age 65 and older, the same type of deal. If you combine those, age group 35 to 65, you get anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000, 27,000 people just in Tulsa County that uh, are symptomatic and would possibly benefit from a venous ablation. That's just in Tulsa County. That's how prevalent uh, venous disease is. So let's talk about again the spectrum of venous disease. So people may present with uh, telangiectasias, varicose veins, and varicose veins by definition are veins that are greater than three millimeters. A reticular vein is something between one and three millimeters. And um, again, they may have skin changes. They may have venous ulcers, and again, like our very first patient, they have superficial bronchiolitis. So when somebody comes in with recurrent superficial bronchiolitis, what does that make you think of? They may just have a man if they have a lot of varicosities, you know, over a long period of time, that may be uh, kosher, that may be okay, but um, they have recurrent superficial bronchiolitis or explosive onset of venous disease, you should possibly get with cancer. And that was the original with Trousseau's, right? With migratory bronchiolitis and pancreatic cancer, that kind of classic uh, question. So again, we'll dive a little bit more into the great sacrament system. Again, it lies in its own superficial fascia. That's why it does have some support, but less support than a muscle. Um, and then these tributary veins are outside of the fascia, usually the bigger veins that kind of you see around the skin. They're unsupported with fascia. So once they develop reflux, you typically notice those a lot more. So it drains, member veins go up. So it drains from the dorsum of the foot, you know, the uh, plantar arch feeds into the great sap and lesser sap and veins, and then the dorsal arch, and then comes up the leg, medial. 10% of return. That's why when they harvest it for bypass surgeries, you know, really people do okay. 
it goes on the 10% of return. Now, when you harvest a vein and you kind of take it out, right where you kind of break it, and the reason we really don't do a lot of stripping anymore is when they get inversion stripping and pull that vein out, nobody's probably seen that unless you're kind of older than me or about my age or so. Or, um, you had a lot of trauma where you broke all those other veins. <clears throat> and remember, bleeding is a potent source for uh, neovascularization. So you tend to get a lot of recurrent venous disease and neovascularization when you've done stripping. In the past. That's why endovenous ablation is just kind of keep welded shut. Um, <clears throat> but you have up to 90% uh, when you have reflux, it usually involves a great saphenous or a tributary of this or small saphenous. Um, and again, if it's unsupported without the fascia, it's got a little fascia and the reflux goes down. The highest column of blood kind of tends to end up around, you know, the ankle, and that's uh, you know, where you have your venous ulcers. You know, it should make sense, right? Medicine should make sense. So how about the small saphenous vein? Uh, you know, we used to kind of somebody used to say, well, if it's on a lateral ankle, it's an arterial ulcer. Right? Well, that's one of those dogma things. That's not true. A lateral ulceration, if they have a normal ankle brachial index, is not an arterial ulceration. Maybe you should think it's from the small saphenous distribution because that's where the small saphenous vein. Even sometimes down into the foot. So a lot of podiatrists and so forth kind of send uh, things in, kind of lateral portion of foot ulcerations, and they actually travel to the vein. As long as we exclude number one arterial. Um, it dives in, so it comes from the lateral foot, dives into the popliteal fossa in five centimeters, and dives into the popliteal vein. Uh, again, we kind of talked already about perforators. So, where do you get varicose veins from? It's largely a hereditary disorder. And in fact, uh, if one parent has venous disease, it's about a 50% chance that you may get venous disease. If both parents have venous disease, it's about a 90% chance that you may get venous disease of some sort. Uh, if neither parent has it, you still have about a 20% chance, and it kind of depends on your occupation. You know, what do we all do? We're on our day all day, right? Pharmacists, nurses, you know, people that work in factories, and so forth. Um, uh, varicose veins, if you kind of have that genetic predisposition, can begin, uh, you know, in, uh, as a child. Diagnosable by ultrasound, but actual clinical varicose veins kind of takes much, uh, much more time. So inactivity, um, standing, People that are sitting, a lady I saw yesterday, she has bad venous disease, started in her teens, and she said she is a death potato. That's what she says. So, you know, what do you, you know, what's your exercise? Because I'm a death potato. And she's a very thin person, but she's a software engineer. But I thought that was pretty cool. Death potato, I haven't heard that one. Um, so uh, prolonged even uh, sitting can predispose to that as well. Pregnancy. Well, how about pregnancy? Well, if you have a predisposition to varicose veins, and then uh, pregnancy is a hormonal, right? Hormonal imbalance between progesterone and estrogen. So high progesterone levels kind of have a relaxation effect on the vascular system, and estrogen, that kind of uh, estrogen progesterone ratio, has an effect on collagen and loosening of the collagen fibers. Okay. So if you think about valves and check valves, which we're going to dive into, um, relaxes those check valves. And that's why you get, uh, when you have relaxing portion in pregnancy too. Uh, and so you get dilation and so forth, and valvular dysfunction where those things don't co-app, and you have their constant between pregnancy. Some of those will end within three months, uh, get better. Some don't go away, but multiple pregnancies, if you have them. So, you know, if you have a predisposition, you should wear compression hose during pregnancy. Um, Okay, so again, we have the deep system that we kind of looked at, superficial system, and of the deep system, 60% um, comes from the calf muscle pump. So people have weak calves, hereditary perineal neuropathies, you know, weak calves, Parkinson's, so forth. You know, they have a weak um, uh, calf muscle pump mechanism. They may have problems with uh, venous disease and decompression. Superficial, and then we talked about perforating veins already. 
So again, it's just a visual when you're ambulating how important that calf muscle pump mechanism is. So, so uh, you know, that 25% comes from the plantar arch return, 60% uh, comes from the calf muscle pump, and approximately 15% only from the thigh. Uh, this would be somebody, this, you have this available here. This is a venous <laughs> reflux uh, PDG exam. It's not, it, it can be a little bit localizing. Um, I don't think we'll go over that. So, um, venous valvular function. Again, we have normal flow with, you know, relaxation and then check valves are checking, abnormal valve functions. Uh, there's <laughs> primary varicose veins, you know, that hereditary, you have foreshortening of the uh, valve leaflets, they don't go out, and you have, can have reflux. Here's just kind of what we look for in a venous ultrasound, specific waveforms. So contraction and so forth. <clears throat> And this is reflux. So you see those valves kind of do that. Remember, you have a lot of valves in your superficial system and deep system. So what happens if you've had a deep vein thrombosis? Remember at that great saphenous saphenofemoral junction, what if you have a DVT at the femoral common femoral area? Well, it's going to strut where the great saphenous comes into that good check valve there at the saphenofemoral junction. It's going to cause a lot of back pressure. So people with deep venous thrombosis, and a lot, there's a lot of perforators too. So if you kind of obstruct that, you kind of tend to get problems, and you kind of tend to get aricosities, which over time causes problems. So again, we have reflux, primary reflux, or we could have reflux with obstruction. Both is worse. And then there's a lot of variations of uh, saphenous veins, you know, there's stuff that... Uh, Different uh, stuff. This is a little bit different theory. You know, it, does everything happen from where that dog went and everything has to be from top down reflux? That's not actually the case because, you know, you can have isolated varicosity with the tributary disease, uh, which are these unsupported with the great saphenous. And if these are big enough, then they can kind of start dilating the great saphenous, which makes it incontinent, and then you can kind of reach up here. So it's kind of a, what's called ascending reflux. So it's interesting that the insurance companies will only pay for if you have descending reflux because some person kind of had this dogmatic deal that, you know, flush ligation of the great saphenous vein was the evolved becomer of you know, the etiology of reflux, and that's not the case. So uh, but we got to kind of pay attention to that. So again, I'm going to get this question. What does uh, poor circulation have to do with my... Uh, uh, legs, or, you know, why does my pore circulation have to do with my swelling? So you got to distinguish between arterial and venous, and we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, edema real quickly. So all edema is lymphedema, if I believe that. You know, all fluid has to be reabsorbed by lymphatics, okay? And what causes edema is the ratio of production, hydrostatic pressures, reabsorption, ontotic pressures, and so forth. Uh, so CHF, venous insufficiency, lymphedema, thyroid, lipoedema, you know, I always draw this out, you know, there's your heart, doesn't look like that, you know, uh, you know, arteries go down, veins go up, you know, your heart pumps blood to your lungs, your lung gets oxygen, and there's your circulation, all right? And then, you know, here's the veins, the one-way check valves, and we just go through this as a kind of little differential. So when you have people that come in the hospital and they have swollen legs, well, what's it from? Well, it could be from congestive heart failure, not only left heart failure, but if they have pulmonary hypertension for any reason, right? Are they obese? You walk in, they're, you know, snoring, you know, and they're kind of big, thick neck. You know, what about sleep apnea? Right? What about pulmonary hypertension? What about smoking? So right heart failure. You know, how much water, pop, tea, coffee, milk, juice, ice do you drink every day? Uh, that type of thing. Uh, kidney disease, liver disease, you know, all of these are uh, secondary hyperaldosterone disease states, so there's so many water kidneys there. Uh, lymphedema, so that's about lipoedema, you know, just subcutaneous fat, hypothyroidism, or is it varicose veins, or is it combination? 
the MS lipoedema. Lymphatic system, uh, kind of through that, makes for interesting conversation. Remember that all, if you have disruption of lymphatics through radiation, surgery, so forth, if you have a family history of lymphatic system dysfunction, you should pay attention to that. And then maybe complete decongestive therapy, compression, uh, they can have vein disease on top of that. Does lymphedema pit? And you're taught dogmatically that lymphedema doesn't pit, right? And that's when they have a fibrotic stage. But early on, lymphedema certainly can be pit. Again, you learn things one way and you really learn things later. Uh, there's a thing called stimmer's sign, where you have kind of chunky toes and you're unable to pinch the skin. That is a sign of lymphedema. Okay. So this guy, all right, here's kind of a question, you know, what does this guy have? What's the etiology of this guy's disease? What do you think? Can it be penis disease? Could it be? Could be. This guy may have you know, deep venous insufficiency, right? I would think that this guy is kind of obese, right? You know, maybe he's snoring, maybe he's a smoker, maybe he uh, he kind of has chunky toes, could have one for him, right? Look at these skin changes, right? That certainly is reflective of venous hypertension, right? So you can have deep venous disease, superficial venous disease. This guy could have sleep apnea, he may be a smoker. Who knows? I mean, he's got a big belly, he may be a drinker, right? He may have them all. So your history and your physical is really important to help people like this. He may come into the hospital three times a year with uh, uh, cellulitis of his lower extremities. And his EF may be 25%. Okay. So again, venous disease can present with just fiber vein, varicose vein, swelling, or ulcers. Uh, one of the ladies that just kind of helped out was on uh, a lot of medicine for restless legs. Didn't really see anything on her legs, but what she really had venous reflux, and she was able to get off of her restless legs medicine. Don't forget arterial checking out. So is there a classification uh, for venous disease? Yes. And just like New York Heart Association classification for heart failure, everybody thinks it's just one, two, three, four, right? Well, there's an etiologic, anatomic, physiologic, and functional classification for in your car association. It's not just class one, two, three, four. You know, etiology, ischemic, non ischemic, anatomic, you know, pulmonary, physiologic, you have 35% functional, you know, class one, two, three. That's the full New York Heart Association classification for heart failure. There are classifications for venous disease clinical, etiology, anatomy and pathophysiology that we just kind of went through. So hopefully this kind of ties it all together. Um, so SEEP scores, then you'll hear SEEP 1 through 6. SEEP 6 is active ulceration, 5 is healed, 4 skin changes, 3 is edema. Uh, nobody really can have zero in this really pristine. That's important for payer sources. Um, that's just for our office. So. Again, history, what's going on? Do they have family history, current medications? Again, we're going to stand the patient up. When you order an ultrasound in a hospital for a VPT, the patient's usually lying down. So what's the gradient of valves when somebody's flat? There is no gradient, right? So how can you test for reflux with somebody that's lying flat? So they'll say, you know, no DVT, augmentation, and inverse of normal. Well, augmentation means they squeeze on a soft flow because there's no DVT. That is not a reflux exam. A reflux exam must be done in a tilted or standing position. So you can say, wow, this guy's got bad varicose veins, but he has a normal, normal venous exam. Well, kind of how was that done and what was it done? So again, quick deal about telangiectasias. They are typically symptomatic. Um, and spider veins. A lot of women have this lateral subdermic plexus, 
and this comes off a little perforating vein called the vein of Albanese around the ankle, uh, around the knee, uh, and that's usually uh, treated with scleral therapy. Reticular veins, just kind of as uh, maybe clusters, they may be symptomatic to reveal. Great saphenous vein. People with great saphenous vein with severe reflux have about 20% risk of ulceration. <coughs> again, hemosiderin deposition. And again, remember I told you those uh, valves, right? So if you have a lot of high pressure, red blood cells tend to leak out, cause venous or hemosiderin, hemosiderin stain. Uh, hemosiderin in the skin is a very side activation, right? White cells leak out, so forth, causing uh, you know, irritation and inflammation. And there's some little nerves that run along those areas and cause numbness anyway, and cause pain, cramping, restless legs. That's how that kind of happens. That's a great happiness distribution, hemosiderin stain. And again, remember we said that you know if they have ulcers on the lateral aspect. Hopefully you recognize now that if they have lateral ankle aspect stain with normal arterial signals, it's probably coming from that small saphenous system. Uh, just chronic skin changes to be aware of, better signs of venous disease. We talked about ulcers. Uh, vein procedures covered by insurance. So if you have an ulceration due to venous reflux, that's actually an <coughs> indication for an intervention, uh, other than compression uh, therapy. Um, if you have C2, C3 disease, or just edema without skin changes or less, you have to demonstrate that you've been in compression for a period of time, conservative therapy, and you still have symptoms. But yes, those are covered. Uh, so again, signs and symptoms of venous disease, you have to wear compression stockings. Well, compression, you know, some people say, well, you fix your veins and uh, you don't have to wear compression. You know, by and large, if you fixed every, every reflux in the vein, uh, that would be true. But venous disease is a progressive disease. So you do have to be very uh, empathetic about people wearing their stockings and so forth, especially if they're providing comfort. Uh, for them. Some people are just like, I'm not wearing those stockings. Well, you need to educate them that they're likely to have progressive symptoms and disease, and simply when they kind of progress to the point that it's impacting their daily life, you know, that's another uh, uh, criteria for intervention from an insurance uh, payer standpoint. So, what is compression? You know, if we have a 20 millimeter stocking, that means there's 20 millimeters of compression, 100% of the angle and less than go up the way. 30 millimeter stocking, etc. cetera. Uh, so compression therapy reduces symptoms of aching, fatigue, and so forth. Uh, reduction of edema, right? You can't get oxygen through a fluid unless you're in the hyperbarics, right? So, you know, if you have a lot of edema, then your skin is hypoxic, right? So reducing the edema improves actually the circulatory status of the skin. Uh, TED hose. We always put people in TED hose. What do they do? So that's only about you know eight to ten millimeters of of uh, compression. So when that patient stands up out of bed, they're going to swell, and that that TED hose is going to act like a tourniquet potentially. It's not strong enough to support their ambulatory venous hypertension. So TED hose are really not. If somebody has true venous hypertension. Uh, TED hose are not the treatment of choice. And that's just kind of a little bit of, uh, so gradient compression hose, if they have an ulcer. So how do you do this endothermal ablation type thing? Uh, um, there's several different ways. In fact, there are kind of all these different ways to intervene on things. Uh, one would be radio frequency. This is kind of have a heat source at the end of the catheter that you put up into the gray satin this vein and you turn on your basic welding kind of thing shut. Uh, you can use laser, you can use mechanical particle assisted on the fire vein. Uh, there's cyanoacrylate, which I've done one of these here in Tulsa. Uh, super glue, that's not covered by insurance. Um, and basically you're putting it in all of these up in saddle thermal junction and then blading it. You can do foam sclerotherapy. Feels the lining of the vein, and then uh, feels the lining of the vein, and then 
if I pull the thing out. <laughs> and again, you're just kind of putting some type of heat source up into the satin thermal junction right there and pulling it back. So, phalangectasias, you can inject. You can strip them. I don't strip them. Uh, be very some people could in certain situations. Also about the incision size for the length of one of my patients there, just little small areas, and those do work really nicely without any scars. That's a patient line like one week later. Um, okay, and we sort of covered pelvic congestion syndrome. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today. So I will end there, hopefully just a couple minutes for questions. So hopefully we kind of talked a little bit about venous disease, the anatomy, the physiology, the function, the where, where or how they can have, you know, anywhere from phalangic patients, all the way to ulcerations, a little bit of pathophysiology, and kind of standard patient stuff. So I'll take some questions. Any questions? Okay, thanks for your attention.